Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this has proved to be a fascinating series on the book of Revelation. This particular lesson is lesson number 10 in that series from March 9 of 2019, entitled God's Everlasting Gospel. I think you'll find it quite interesting as we have. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, this gospel is your gospel, and we wish that we understood it more clearly. We know that that opportunity will be ours as we study for the rest of eternity all about the good news that, that's represented in these, this passage. And this is such an important section of the Bible for Seventh-day Adventists. So help us to do our very best in understanding it and explaining it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I can remember the days when I was a child and when someone joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the usual expression was, have you accepted the third angel's message? That was just the way you said, if someone joined the church, have you accepted the third angel's message? Well, I wonder how that all got started. Anyway, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about the three angel's message. It's a section found in Revelation 14, 6-12. We'll talk about some other passages as well, but that'll be the main subject. And we're told and we believe that these messages are the messages we are to carry to the world in the final time period of this Earth's history. Uh, of course, you could imagine that Satan, if he knows that this is the final message to be carried to the world, is not too excited about it. So he's going to do everything he possibly can to oppose it. And it's pretty strong language, especially the third angel's message. And we know for sure that that message, that strong message would not be like that, except for the fact that in Revelation 13, verses 15 to 17, which is a introductory, the previous chapter, it says these words, the second beast was allowed, now this is Satan's side, the second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without, without having this mark, that is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. So what does that sound like? That sounds like a death threat, doesn't it? For God's people? Yeah. So now, how would you respond if you were God? Take a dinner. With love. <laughs> yeah. If you were God, you'd do it. Yeah, okay. Doesn't sound like humans. So let's, let's you know, it's, it's good for us to take both sides here once in a while. Why are Satan's deceptions so successful? Weakness of the flesh, for one thing. <laughs> okay. Well, we're we're selfish, and it and you know he kind of encourages selfishness. That's, that's his specialty, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So how can we protect ourselves against those deceptions? Well, let's just remember that any kind of a deception, no matter how subtle it might be, is a lie of of whatever sorts. And in order to deal with lies, you need to know what. Truth. The truth. You need to know the truth. So, of course, we would say every Seventh-day Adventist is so fully grounded in the truth that he could never be deceived, right? No. Hardly. That didn't take long. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> that would be nice. It would be nice. Well, it's important to notice a few key points, a few key details, contrary to what many people have read, who, who have read the book of Revelation might think, and what I believe for many years, the final choice will not be between worshiping God and not worshiping God. And that's sort of the impression you would get if you look around the world today. You say, well, there's some people who worship God and a lot of people who don't. No, it will be a choice of who we are to worship, God or Satan. Everybody will be worshiping one or the other. Now, that gives us another challenge. How, how is Satan going to get all those people to worship him? Well, they will receive the mark, yes? Yeah, so if they're seeking, you know, his basic thing is to do your own will. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came to do the will of the Father. So there's kind of a separation right there. So 
uh, if we seek to do the will of the Father, then we are worshiping God, and if we are seeking to do our own will, then we're worshiping Satan, whether we know it, uh, it or not. Yeah. Well, what are people worshiping today? Money? Whatever they spend their time on. Sports? Fame, fame power, fame. sports, movies, fashion, music. Take your choice. Various lusts. But someone pointed out to me one time, and I think this is a key idea. If your main focus is on something outside of yourself, something that's external control, not internal control, you've automatically placed yourself under the devil's control. Because everything out there, Satan can one or, an or another control it. Now remember, in, in under, understand that doesn't mean we need to be totally selfish. Um, but remember, Jesus on the cross relied on the evidence already given to him by the Father. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who have committed themselves to God's word so thoroughly and carefully that nothing that's going on out there of a sensory nature of any kind will be able to turn them away from what they already have believed from their own study and so forth. Now the Bible is outside us, God is outside us, so... But the Holy Spirit will make those things a part of us. We are to become partakers of the divine nature. That's what we're talking about. If we become partakers of the divine nature, if we actually give God enough opportunity, the Holy Spirit enough opportunity to actually come into our minds and, and control us and help us to understand, it basically help us to think like God. If that can happen, then we can shut out all the devil's tricks out there and, and remain faithful. Where does self-control come in with, into that? Well, that's what we're talking about. We're saying that uh, if you, you know, and of course you know the, the Galatians 5 right in there, that one of the, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is self-control. Self -control. Yeah. yeah. Galatians 5, 23, 22, 23. Well, what is it going to take? Now let me go back to God's side. What's it going to take for Adventists and whoever that includes, God's faithful people, what is it going to take to get all of those people inspired to carry the three angels' messages to the world? Have you ever tried to figure out where, how we're going to get from where we are now to where we need to be? I think before we can carry it to the world, we need to know what the third angel's message really is. I think there are very few that actually understand it, and I'm not sure that I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and remember that as God ramps up his efforts, guess who's ramping up his efforts? Satan. Satan is going to get more and more deceptive as we get closer. Well, what do you think? Do you think um, the proclamation, the, the, the latter rain, or whatever you choose to call it, the proclamation of the three angels' messages, you think that started? Is it happening right now? What's amazing is some places in the world where it seems like the gospel just was stuck in the mud, it could hardly make any progress at all, now some of those places the gospel is going like wildfire. In places where it's not even, some places where it's, quote, illegal. Yeah. It's spreading like you wouldn't believe. And other places where, it's, where the gospel used to be doing pretty well, it seems to be now it's sort of stagnant. So some, at some point in time, we've got to have a, a worldwide fire. What could make that happen? Carrie, I think you have some words about that. Yes. At infinite cost, a way of salvation has been provided. Shall Christ's great sacrifice be in vain? Shall the earth be entirely controlled by satanic agencies? The salvation of souls is dependent upon the consecration and activity of the members of the Church of God. The Lord calls upon those who believe in Him to be workers together with Him. While their life shall last, they are not to feel that their work is done. 
until the time shall come when Christ shall say it is finished. The work for the saving of souls will not decrease but will grow in importance. A thousand times more work for God might be accomplished if all his children would fully consecrate themselves to him. If they would improve every opportunity for doing good, doors for service would open before them. They would be called to bear greater responsibilities. It comes from Review wow. and Herald, November 23, 1905, paragraph 13. And there's a footnote that says, compare PH 164, words of encouragement to workers in the home missionary field from 1904. Wow. Looks like page 16, paragraph 3. Yeah. A thousand times more. That means we've got a ways to go, huh? Yeah. Well, as described in Revelation 14, three angels are flying in the midst of heaven with very important messages. While we do not have time now to look at the, all the evidence, there is powerful evidence to suggest that the actual messages are to be carried by God's faithful end-time people. Do we want to be among that group? Yes. Do we understand clearly that the ones who are to proclaim these messages to the world are not angels but us? How can we best represent God in opposition to the messages of Satan and his counterfeits? Roman Catholicism and apostate Protestantism. And those words are Adventist words that you're almost afraid to, to talk about on uh, television. But let's, let's, let's see if we can sort of figure out where that all comes from. The first angel's message. Look at Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air, with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples on the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation, he said in a loud voice, what do you suppose it's implied by a loud voice? For everyone everybody, want, everybody needs to hear it. Yes. Honor God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. What does that remind you of? Creation. Creation. Not only creation, but to talk about creation in the Sabbath commandment, huh? What is the significance of calling this message the everlasting gospel? Why would it be why should it be called the everlasting gospel? Well God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's consistent and his love never fails. Those are just okay. some of the texts that you might call in that uh, support the idea that it's everlasting. Okay, there's another implication by there, a little bit more hidden away in that idea. It's suggesting that God knows the end from the beginning. If that's the case, then why do we have in verse uh, 6, that, that text says that for him to judge, uh, imply that God's going to do the judging, but we yeah. have many, many texts where it says God ju doesn't judge anyone. Mm -hmm. It's the truth or the words that he has spoken will be your judge. So it seems to me that that is not the best uh, translation to be used in this okay, particular we're gonna, instance. We're gonna, yeah, good question. We're going to get to that. Uh, we, we need to deal with that is issue specifically. When I look at it, I see with the eternal message of good news, then to myself I'm saying, well, what is that? Yeah. Down there in verse 6 it says judgment. Judgment is that first angel's message, isn't it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's what we're trying to figure out. We're judging God, though, is what we're what it boils down to. Do yeah, we want to listen to God? It? Yeah, it's a two-way street. God is always, let's make it very clear right up front, God has always wanted to save everybody, even the devil. Now, we know that's not possible, and he knows that's not possible. He weeps as he sees so many people turning away from him. And the best verse in the Bible on that is probably Hosea 11, 7 and 8. They insist in turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma, or treat you as I did Zeboim? So, and these are, Adma and Zeboim were two tiny little towns right next to uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is crying out, this 
Hosea lived about 10 years before the northern kingdom of Israel was completely ab obliterated by the Assyrians and just taken over. And, and God is just crying out, how can I let you go? What can I do? I, I think a better rendering would be that the time has come to judge God. It, it, the word, Greek word I understand is krisis, which yeah. means a, a separation uh, as opposed to a, a, a court trial or something like that. The first would be separation. And uh, the judgment is about God. I mean, uh, God, the infant one doesn't need to do any judging. It's we judge God, Romans 3, 4. May you win your case when you are taken into court. Well, what's a court? The whole, whole, whole universe, uh, all intelligent creatures are doing the judging of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that of us, the, in Daniel 7, it says, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Most High. Yeah. It's, this is a two-way, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Those who have carefully read their Bibles understand that God does not change and that His plan has been in place since before the world was created. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and Titus 1, 2. We need to note that it is a message of judgment for those who refuse to listen to God, and it is a message of reward to those who faithfully worship Him. We are told that these messages will be carried to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Those are the same groups that Satan is trying to influence, Revelation 13, 7, and 16. No one is going to be left out of the final battles in the great controversy. So, look at Revelation 16. We're going to jump forward a little bit here to verses 13 and 14. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the day, for the battle on the great day of Almighty God. So, we see that God's trinity is being opposed by Satan's trinity. Now, that might be a term that you're not so familiar with, but it's Satan himself, the sea beast, in, in signif signifying Roman Catholicism, and the false prophet or lamb-like beast, representing apostate Protestantism. And those are, those are the ones described in Revelation 13. Is that, that sometimes called the land beast? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are several terms that need to be understood before we can correctly understand the three angels' messages. The first term is the term fear. What does it mean to fear God and give Him glory? Revelation 14, 7, New King James. There are many passages throughout Scripture suggesting that the word fear only sometimes means terror. Uh, far more often it represents respect, reverence, honor, or even worship. And Margaret, I think you have some words about that. Job 1, 8. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And this is from the New American Standard Bible, uh, 1995 update. Did you notice my service, servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and as good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. That came from the American Bible Society, the Holy Bible, the Good News Translation, uh, New York American Bible Society. So the word fear should be understood to mean reverence, respect, and honor for other references. See, and I would just encourage you, there's so many quotations, so many references here in this lesson. Really encourage you to look at our website at theox.org. That's T H E O X.org. And you can download this handout, uh, this study guide for yourself. But here we have Revelation 11, 18, 19, 5, Deuteronomy 5, 29, 11, 13, Matthew 22, 37, and on and on and on. It goes a whole bunch of references. Then. Um, Okay, in modern terms, the fear of God means to take God seriously enough to enter into a relationship with Him, to follow His warnings and to avoid evil, and to do His commandments, even the ones that may be inconvenient or worse. It is a call to live and act as those who know that they will give account to God one day. According to this verse, such a serious calling will be a part of the experience of God's end-time people. And this comes from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School 
lesson Bible study guide 1933 or 133 excuse me yeah. so what actually happens in the end time judgment and Jim was trying to get ahead of us here what do we mean when we say the hour of his judgment has come that's the New King James Version Revelation 14 7 traditionally of course this has been understood to suggest that God is judge of the world and will judge every single individual that has ever lived and that's clearly portrayed in Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10 and other parts of the scripture but the passage could also mean that the time has come for God to be judged and that's Romans 3 4 not many people are familiar with that idea let's look at it here really quick and I'm gonna actually start with um, I'm gonna start with verse 1 have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles or is there any value in being circumcised much indeed in every way in the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must, show, must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. So, Who is the you? The you is and, God? Yes, this is... God must be true. It is, it's, yeah, and, and if you look at the context in the Old Testament, yes, it's talking about, it's God speaking. I mean, it's, it's, it's talking about speaking, about judging God, yeah. Yeah, my version says he will be proved right in what he says, yeah. and he will win his case in court. Yeah. What, what version is that? This is a New <coughs> Living Bible. And who is he referring to? To God. Okay, God will win his case when he yeah. is... Yeah, so yeah. no, everyone else in the world is a liar. God is true. As the scriptures say, he will be proved right in what he says, and he will win his case in court. The NIV says, may you prevail when you judge, something to that effect, as yeah. if God is judging. It's just the opposite of what, what <coughs> the, the text should really mean. So well, it, it's... What's happening here, every person in the universe has cast or will cast his or her vote either for God or against God by joining God's side or by joining Satan's sides. Thus we judge God and Satan, and God's judgment will be final. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and Revelation 22, 11, and 12. So judgment is also part of the good news. To those who choose God's side, it, it means vindication, salvation, freedom, eternal life of course that also means that for those who choose against God the disobedient the unrepentant that all, that will uh, that it will be an end time judgment our message but God does not want anyone to be lost and here's our second Peter 3 9 the Lord is not slow to do what he has promised as some think instead he's patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants all to turn away from their sins that's of course my good news Bible Here's the, uh, uh, I'm going to read, uh, so I'd rather do it from memory, uh, from the NIV. So that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Yeah, no. I mean, it just, but no. that's the broad spectrum of, of what we have with problem with Bible translations. Yeah. But well, that's talking about God judging, isn't it? When I hear yes. That. Yeah. God judging. Yeah, God but doesn't judge that's anybody. Not what, that's, that's not what, what the, says. That's, that's right. That's not what it says in the Greek. Yeah, oh, and it's really a quote from uh, Psalms 51.4. Yeah. Psalms. No, it's... it's 51... It's Psalm 51.7? Yeah, it's 7, I think. Yeah, or anyway, yeah. So that's a, it is fair to say that at the end of time, the people of the world will fall into two different worship groups. Those who fear and worship God and those who worship Satan and the beast. Now, they're not going to think, uh, you know, that they're worshiping the beast or Satan. It's not talking about attending church or going through a set of ceremonies. This is about one consider, what one considers most important in his or her life. That's what it's really about. So Revelation 14, 6 and 7, which we've already read, talk about an everlasting gospel, but they also talk about judgment. How are the judgment and the gospel related? Well, judgment is passed in favor of the saints of the Most High. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you could argue over who's doing that judgment, where it's God or the, the seated hosts in Daniel 7. But Jesus, Jesus has some very interesting things to say about the relationship between the gospel and judgment. 
John 12, 31 to 33, now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the rule of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. So here he's saying, somehow or other, the truth of the gospel and my salvation and so forth that I accomplished by dying on the cross is going to result in what? The ruler of this world being judged and overthrown, right? Mm -hmm. And there are lots of other places. Revelation 5, 5 to 10, John 3, and, and just one of the clearest places look at is John 3, 18 to 21. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So, who's doing the judging? We are doing the judgment, judging not only of God by the way we cast our vote, but we're judging ourselves by the way be, we behave, by the way we respond to the gospel. There's nothing mysterious about God's judgment. God does not operate in secret or behind closed doors. His government is totally and completely transparent. Surrounding God's thrones, there are those four living creatures, those are the 24 elders, and there's hundreds of millions of angels watching everything God does. It'll be a little hard to uh, hide in uh, secret when you've got that kind of an audience, right? You can be sure that they are fully satisfied that everything God does is fair, righteous, and just. In fact, the book of Revelation says so. Read Revelation 4 and 5, which we've already talked about. Five times in those two chapters, it, it says, God, you, you did it. You did it right. You did everything. You did it right. You're righteous. You're fair. You're... So a careful reading of scriptures makes it very clear that in the end, Satan and his allies and all his followers will be what? Thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, 20 and 20 verses 10 and 11. So this all out battle at the end which it may be a part of the battle of Armageddon over the minds and hearts of humankind, is a battle over the minds and hearts of human mind. Uh, look at Revelation, I'm sorry, look at Exodus 22 to 11. Those are the, the Ten Commandments given originally given to Moses. And compare Revelation 13, and we don't have time to read those all right now, but I will summarize it for you. The first commandment, what does the first commandment say? Worship God only. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment tells us to worship God only. But the beast demands that we worship him. So he breaks the first commandment. Revelation 17, 13, 7 and 8. The second commandment tells us to do what? Not to set up any images. Not to worship any, any images, right? But the beast sets up an image to himself to be worshipped. Revelation 13, 14 and 15. So he breaks the second commandment. The third commandment tells us not to speak evil, especially of God. But the beast and his allies speak blasphemy against God and his name. Revelation 13, 5 and 6. So what are we seeing happening here? He's breaking every commandment in the book, right? The fourth commandment tells us to worship God as our creator and redeemer by worshiping him on the seventh day Sabbath. And what does the other side say? The beast demands that we worship him on Sunday. So there's just a quick rundown. He just absolutely flagrantly, uh, you know, you know, breaks the first four commandments. So those, those are the ones about our relationship with God, and mm -hmm. obviously he's trying to become God mm -hmm. in place of the true God. So let me ask you out there: Do we honor and love God enough to really want to keep His commandments? Or do you still feel like keeping God's commandments is kind of a burden that you have to bear around? Or like Satan, do we want to do our own thing and thus worship at Satan's altar? Do we recognize the advantages of doing things God's way or not? Do we want to live in a universe governed by love or by selfishness leading to mutual destruction? 
<laughs> it is important to notice that the expression worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water cannot fail to remind us of what portion of the Old Testament scripture? The, the, Sabbath, the Sabbath, Sabbath commandment. The Sabbath commandment. Thus we see that the first angel's message is a clear call <coughs> to worship our creator and friend. And Jim, I think you have a passage there. I think Gordon has that actually. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. So there's the opposition there. Mm -hmm. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, received the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, received the seal of God. Ellen White, Great Controversy 605. I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking caps for just a moment here and answer me. Do you think that people in the world in general have any idea that there's this kind of choice is in front of them? No. I don't think most people do. Mm -mm. It's like we have this thing that either you worship God or worship Satan, but an awful lot of people aren't aware that they're worshiping Satan. Will they ever be? If anything, they think they're worshiping themselves. Yeah. So Jim asked, they don't need will they be aware? And I think they will be at some point in time Something aware. Something has to happen. To Something get dramatic has to change. And that's what I'm asking you about. What dramatic is going to happen? Well, Dr. Uh, Ravancha, near the end of his life, when he was retired up in Washington, used to talk about a uh, catalyst. Mm -hmm. You put a small amount of some chemical into yeah. a large vat, it can change it you yeah. know, instantly. And so some... It would take some, he thought of us, the church, as that small catalyst that would mm -hmm. change the world. So, uh, well, I mean, we're, a rel I mean, we're more than 20 million Seventh-day Adventists, or people who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists now, but that's just a tiny little drop in a bucket compared to the world population of 7 mm -hmm. billion. So, somehow or other... Something needs to happen to yeah. get the attention of the population of the world. Of all the world. Yeah. So, what I think it takes each of us seeking choice. individually as well as collectively to, mm -hmm. to reach that. Yeah. So, once again, how are, how are our views of creation and salvation related to each other? Well, in one sense, if, if it... Uh, Creation didn't occur like it does, says in Genesis, but things went on for millions and millions of years with death, destruction, you have disease and yep. fossils. Then there really never was a fall. Yeah. This is how it's supposed to be. It's just supposed to get a bit better. Uh, and uh, so, as one atheist said in a debate, Jesus is out of a job mm -hmm. if you don't have that original fall with Adam and Eve. Well, but there was a fall before, and so the, the, what we st the Genesis account is just a, a another a story of recreation. What do we do with the war in heaven? That's the yeah. next Well, that's fall. a different. So, yeah. What? Uh, no, that's our, ours with Adam and Eve. That was the second next fall, the yeah. second fall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because we already had evil arrive Ex in heaven. Exactly. In the courts of heaven. So. But it's for us that Jesus gave his life, not yeah. angels. When well, you sure look at what's going to be the big for, issue. Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and well, 10. Well, we're, we're being watched. Well, it was for the lost? benefit. For, well, not, it's not The lost ones, are, they've already made their decision, apparently have not made their decision. But the, the others... Lost people out there and the other... Uh, no, but there, there are people out there who had questions, still questions about God, and those questions about God were answered yeah. by the life and death of Jesus. But yeah. they're not lost the in the same that. sense that no. we are. No, no, not in that same sense, no. So, but, of course, we believe that creation and the Sabbath go together. The Bible makes that very clear. We believe that the Sabbath is a time of, of love. It's a time of service for others. Satan's crew, what do they think Sunday is for? Entertainment. Football, right? 
No, I'm NFL owns Sunday. <laughs> yeah. And now they've got religion for a lot of people. And yeah. And they're putting games in other places during the week too. To it's for entertainment and self-pleasing. Well, the second angel's message. The second angel's message very clearly announces the fall, apostasy, and ultimate destruction of Babylon and its associates. And I think, Myra, you have something on that? Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. Ellen G. White, Great Controversy, page 382 to 383. Okay, and let's just read the second angel's message while we're thinking about it here. Revelation 14, 8. It's also in 18, 2 and so forth. A second angel followed the first one saying, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine the strong wine of her immoral lust. The strong wine of her immoral lust. Wow. Just as Nebuchadnezzar in ancient Babylon tried to force everyone to bow down and worship his golden statue out there on the plain of Dura, so modern day Babylon will try to force God's faithful people to worship Satan, the, the sea beast, and the land beast, and they will do that on the day he chose, which is Sunday. And you can read about that in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, chapter 16, verse 13, and chapter 17, verse 5. You know, it uses that term force. You know, the, may the force be with you. Oh, boy. All of that's just the antithesis of the way God really operates. Right. It's freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. If you've got a gun to your head, aren't you being forced uh, to make a decision? But only when the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. Great Controversy 390. In reading these passages about Babylon, we notice that she has a wine. The wine of her fornication or immoral lust, as my translation says. What does this wine symbolize? Well, we've already said that Revelation 17 pictures end-time Babylon as a harlot, making people on earth drunk with her wine of immorality. And Jim, there's your... Forn fornication, a figure of the illicit connection between the church and the world or between the church and the state. The church should be married to her Lord, but when she seeks the support of the state, she leaves her lawful spouse. By her new connection, she commits a spiritual fornication compare, compare Ezekiel 16:15 James 4:4 4, 4. okay and that's from, from right. F. FD Nickel Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary volume 7 well so let's think about that for a minute the wine of babylon clearly refers to its false deceptive teachings how how are those would you say those deceptive teachings are spreading around our world today? Oh, yeah. Can you give an example? Well, Sunday hmm. Allegiance. Uh... Okay, Sunday Allegiance is an obvious point. Well, what you notice if you're, if you're paying attention to any of the religious news is that more and more of the major churches the big ones that we know the names of and so forth, are moving back closer and closer and closer to the Roman Catholic Church. And some churches, I won't mention them by name right now because I don't want to condemn anyone, but have just come out recently and said the objections we had to the Roman Catholic Church 500 years ago, we don't have we don't object to those things anymore. We don't we don't have any differences with the Roman Catholic Church today. Wow, ideas are creeping in, such as the, theistic evolution and obvious contradiction to creation. Theological traditions are replacing the idea of the Bible and the Bible only as our guide and counselor. Uh, we've talked about this before, but let me just mention it very quickly. There are churches in our world today that believe that. Whatever seems right now 
is more important than whatever happened in the past. In other words, there are churches who literally believe that their authority, the head of the church, has the authority to change what the Bible says because we have a better idea now than what they had in the past. By contrast, those of us who believe in the Bible and the Bible only as our guide say anything new that we come up with has to agree with what we had in the past. We can't get rid of what past. If you want to add something, you want to add a new idea or something, it better agree with what's already there. It doesn't replace what's there. We already know that intoxicated people can't think clearly. So what ideas do you see in the world around you which make you think of our example, which make you think of examples of the wine of Babylon? Gender confusion, yeah. marriage issues. Uh. Okay, well, the third angel's message. Look at Revelation 14, 9 to 11. This is the scariest language in the whole Bible. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their head, on their hand, I'm sorry. Now, we already read Revelation 13, 15 to 17, and what did they say? If you don't worship the beast, you're going to die, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're seeing, okay, if you, if you do worship the beast and get the mark on the forehead or on the hand, you will, they will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. You think uh, the holy angels and the Lamb are going to spend the rest of eternity watching the wicked die, burn? No. Sounds like it. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image for anyone who has the mark of its name. Wow. Does that sound like a loving God? No. Not read superficially, it doesn't. It is the most fearsome language as we've already suggested anywhere in Scripture. But there are several things that we need to notice. In the third angel's message, we see God's response to Satan's deadly threats in Revelation 13, 15 to 17. So, if Satan's threatening you with death, if you don't join his side, it's not quite so surprising to find God speaking so, so strongly about his side, right? Because if we die in the Lord, we, we die that time and then we are raised later. But if you die uh, the death that those who will never come back from, in the process of that death, it's going to be a yeah. terrible thing as they see <coughs> the truth for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you, if, you, <coughs> if you read these two passages superficially, you would think, okay, the devil is going to destroy all of God's people, and God's going to destroy all of the devil's people. There's not going to be left, anybody left here on earth, right? Well, they're thre we're threatened with death, that, but the question is raised in the next lesson whether we actually die or not. Okay, well, we, all, we don't even have to wait till we get there because we read in verse 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commands and are faithful to Jesus. So apparently there's going to be some people who survive, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. The wording clearly suggests that God's faithful people will have survived through Satan's end time threats. Do we understand all the language of the third angel's message? Or are we inclined to misrepresent God by how we explain the third angel's message? It's very easy to explain the third angel's message in a way that seems to confirm Satan's accusations against God. We certainly don't want to do that. Remember Satan's accusations against God? Arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, severe, a tyrant. Those are all direct accusations from Satan. So what is God's wrath or anger? Giving up. God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own destructive choices. Does God turn away or does he just watch as they wander off? 
and no, basically, honor yes. their ch honor their choice. I don't think he's really think active on God's part. The story of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. prodigal son, the father gave him the the inheritance, and the guy wandered off, yeah. and the father went out and kept looking for him yeah. to come back. Ultimately, did in the story. We have a couple passages that help us to understand that here in in Hosea. Hosea 4.17, the people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. I mean, God says he doesn't use force. So if you're determined to go in the other direction as fast as you can go, God will say, I'm sorry. He will weep. Well, for a much more complete explanation of God's wrath, see, and there's a link here that you can look up. It's in the uh, teacher's guide section of Theox about God's anger, God's wrath. Um, I think we probably have time to read a couple of these passages. Look at Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. We just read this. They will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the whole angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in his image for anyone who has the mark of its name. What in the world does all that mean? Sounds pretty stark. Sounds Very pretty bad. But is it, bad. But is it literal? If okay. a fire and brimstone came up down on me, I'd be gone pretty quick. Uh -huh. Well, so. fire and brimstone came down on Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are no longer there. Yep. Right. right. How do we understand this? The smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever and ever? The well, smoke is the result of the fire. Yeah. The, it's, it's, the, the consequence is the result of the fire. They're, they're not right. the fire. Right. So the memory of what they went through will always be it w accessible. It, it, has an eternal, it has an eternal consequence. Yeah. And for those who think that the wicked are going to be burning forever, I would like to suggest that you look at Isaiah 66, verse 24. Very last verse in Isaiah. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to the whole human race. Now, we usually don't like to read that, because it, but look at it carefully. What is being destroyed there? Dead bodies. Dead bodies. This is not live people being burned or tortured or something else like this. It's dead bodies. And what happens to this? This is an example of the, 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 the garbage put out, pit outside of Jerusalem. You threw stuff out there and it burns until it's consumed. So the expression fire and brimstone in the Bible clearly refers to total destruction. Margaret, you already mentioned the current status of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not still burning, but Genesis 14, 29, 20, yeah, not, 19, 24 says, um, Suddenly the Lord rained burning sulfur on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And fire and brimstone in the, in the King James. So, and like you said, how much is left of Sodom and Gomorrah? If you look at Isaiah 34, 8 to 10, Isaiah spoke of the future in his day, destruction of Edom by, Edom by fire and brimstone. And how much of that kingdom is still left? Nothing. So what about you and your church? Are you ready to spread the three angels' messages to your community? This may seem like a daunting, perhaps even impossible task, but it is our task. We have accepted it as a church. All right. Dennis? Yeah, so this is from Great Controversy 611, uh, paragraph 3 to 612, paragraph 2. Um, the great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. I'm going to interrupt you once or twice this. So do we have a special name for the, for the manifestation of God's power that's connected with the final events in this earth's history? Holy Spirit. The latter rain. The latter rain. The Holy yeah. Spirit in the latter rain. Okay. So that's what we're talking about here. Go the prophecies ahead. which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, quote, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, 
Then the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus, unquote, Acts 3, 19 and 20. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. Thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, the signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Revelation 13.13 13. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. Can I interrupt again? What do you think is going to happen that's going to make, quote, thousands of voices all over the world? Uh, see, where is it here? Their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration. You think that's going to be visible? Could be. Sounds Remember, like it. What? Sounds like it. Remember what, what happened when Moses came down from the mount? His face shone because he's been in the presence of God. Shone so brightly that people couldn't look at him. Mm -hmm. Could that happen again? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many of those minds were impressed, whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. Wow. Great controversy. 611 and 612. That's a pretty powerful collection of quotations, huh? If we believe that we as Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to be spreading the message of the three angels to the entire world, are we practicing to get ready to do that? When was the last time you heard a sermon seriously discussing the three angels' messages? Are we filling, fulfilling God's wish for us? Do we clearly understand the messages of the three angels? Could you, out there, could you put together a presentation that you could give to your neighbors and say, let me explain God's final message to this earth and make it sound like God is a God of love? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? If we can't do that, I hope we're not spreading the third angel's <laughs> message. Maybe that's why, then maybe that's why we're not doing so well yet. huh? Yeah. Well, are we fulfilling God's wish for us? Do we clearly understand the messages of the three angels? Can we explain them? And we've already said that. How is the Sabbath linked to these three messages? The Sabbath is connected to every one of the three messages. How do we... Obviously, it's connected to creation. It's talked about in the first message. It's talked about coming out of Babylon. It's in, this, in the second message. It's talked about... It's the, the mark that's, that makes God's true people the right ones versus the ones that the devil has on the other side. Well, <clears throat> there's the rest of Revelation 14 we're just going to touch very briefly. I'm not going to even take time to read it because we don't have time. There talks about two harvests. One is a harvest reaped by a scythe, yielding a useful harvest of grain. The other is a harvest of grapes, which are trampled in the wine press of God's anger. Wow. And then there's the first few verses of Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. How are these verses related to Revelation 12, 17? Because in Revelation 14, well, in Revelation 12, 17, it talks about a remnant. But in Revelation 14, 1 to 5, it talks about 144,000. You think those two are related somehow? Not sure? Well, the remnant is those who remain and under. 44,000 are 
the ones that God focuses on as his okay his uh, examples so is this are we talking about two groups that are going to be near near the end of the earth's history they both seem to be don't they they seem to be the same time and purpose so same time purpose and so on and they're probably the same question mark Okay, so what kind of worship is being discussed in Revelation 13 and 14? Just to summarize, the word worship of, or one of its derivatives is, is found seven times in these two chapters. The worship of Satan is discussed in Revelation 13, 4, 8, 12, 15, and in Revelation 14, 9, and 11. The faithful worship of God is taught in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Clearly, these ver verses focus on the core issue in the Great Controversy. And what's the core issue? Is God trustworthy? Is he worthy of worship? That's what we're talking about. Or would we be better off worshiping Satan? In what ways do Satan's followers worship him? Why do you think the idea of a judgment is unpopular about many Christians today, among many Christians today? It's much easier to believe that once you make a statement that you accept Jesus Christ, then you are saved and you do not have to do anything else. But God cannot admit to heaven anyone who is not safe to have there. He cannot allow the great controversy to start all over again. Just imagine that. So the difference between Sunday worshipers and Sabbath worshipers is not just a 24-hour period. The worship of God includes the belief that he is creator and that love is the very foundation of his government and that we will choose intentionally to do what is right because it is right. Sunday worshipers, while they probably would not admit this, will in the end choose to place their own ideas ahead of God's ideas, and thus, like Satan, will be worshiping self. So on which side do you want to be? Think about the ways in which people worship themselves in our day. If you think that uh, Sunday afternoons for collapsing on the on the couch and watching TV, whether you're watching a football game or uh, some kind of other program, what are you doing? What is entertainment for? Keep you occupied. Keep you occupied. It, it's to satisfy your fantasies or your ideas and so forth. It's to satisfy you. And that is a form of worshiping Satan. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these words that have help, helped us to understand a little more clearly what these verses, which are so important, might say to us. Help us not to be afraid, but to gather courage, not only to study these passages more clearly so we can have them firmly and clearly in our minds, but may we find ways to present them in a loving, compassionate way that's convincing to our neighbors and friends is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.